credit bureau, just as the retail credit company with its main office in it, grossed over $125 million. If you have ever applied for insurance, opened a charge account, bought something on the installment plan, retail credit company or a similar company did a check on you. Here is a vice president of the company, Mr. Charles Watts. Our main business is insurance reporting, life, fire, burglary, bond, in the marine, any kind of insurance, and that perhaps comprises, oh, maybe 60 to 65 percent of our report. Then we're in the business of making reports on prospective employees, and this is a large market. Uh, we probably have 20 percent of our business in that particular area. We have about 40 or 45 million files. They're located uh, 100,000 here, 300,000 there, depending upon the population breakdown. So we have 313 branches. So the whole area of uh, information gathering is what retail credit company specializes in. We have 12,000 people in our company, of whom probably, oh, in the vicinity of nearly, of about 8,000 are salaried investigators for the parent company on the streets every day, gathering information for one purpose or another. Well, we're going up there to talk to the employment manager. This is Frank Phipps manager. of King City, Alabama, a credit Mark investigator. Smith. With him is a trainee, Charles Flynn of Tupelo, Mississippi, who is being shown the ropes. So what we just want to the do first is step is usually the address telephone directory, a handy tool for getting the names and telephone numbers of the neighbors of people under investigation. The questions asked and answered about prospective policyholders are often highly personal. A general area is uh, who is the man, where has he lived, how long has he been there, is he married, uh, his children, what he does for a living, his outside interest, his health. Your health, you're getting down to the question of where some people might balk on giving information and uh, you understand that we they have no obligation to us and if they decline any information then of course we don't hold it against them. if they won't tell us and we'll go and we'll ask the neighbors the investigators may talk to anyone a boss former employer local banker but they rely heavily on what neighbors have to say so your personal file with the credit company often is based on what your neighbors think and tell the investigator about you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Frank Phipps, an insurance inspector, looking for some information on a fellow named Ted. Is it right across the street here at 1100? No, he's heart condition, or is he diabetic, or handicapped, or anything like that. He didn't live here, though. All right, well, I think that takes care of it. And thank you very much. People are willing to talk about their neighbors and spread gossip. Frank told us that there are very few people who will not answer his questions. Uh, a lady across the street said that he lived over here. Mm -hmm. He's a young fellow, about 25 or so. You got a son or a relative, anybody like that living here with you that's moved mm -hmm. down? We've definitely got the wrong number. There's no mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much. We'll try that other one. Then. All right, shoot. Which way do we go from here? We're going to take a left here. Okay, you, well, you looked that inquiry over now, and you know what we need. Mm -hmm. This is just a regular life case. Going a flat tire, was it? Be straightforward, no uh, hazards on employment. We might find a questionable environment down here. I don't know. Where you live? I live right, right over there, huh? That brick house? Oh, we where your mom is. They ask the questions with the detachment of a doctor doing a medical examination. What kind of help? Well, they're real nice people. What kind of neighbor is he? You know, the people you run around with and what he does? Well, you know, when I see him passing them down the road, you know. What about his drinking habits? How much does he drink? I know no drink, Does he drink? Oh, thank you, ma'am. The question is standard on every investigation. That means Retail Credit Corporation and its affiliates have information largely gathered from neighbors on the drinking habits of 45 million Americans. If they find out you drink too much, there is another questionnaire which asks more information from your neighbors. What does he usually drink? Beer, wine, whiskey? How often does he drink? To what degree? Is he loud and boisterous? His family health. Your, uh, your health and health is body diabetic or no. heart condition. I'm amazed at how uh, glibly people will talk about their neighbors when they are approached by private detectives. Instead of saying to the detective, who are you? Uh, who do you represent? What are your credentials? What are you after? 
it seems that people uh, jump, fall all over one another uh, trying to tell this individual who comes into a town or a city the latest gossip. I think this is not the kind of responsibility that we owe to our fellow men. This collection of facts, hearsay and gossip, is typed up and sent to the insurance company or merchant who has ordered it. Once your credit file has begun, your creditors are not shy about reporting whether you are fast pay, slow pay, or no pay. This record, good or bad, can follow you wherever you move. It is impossible to get rid of, since there is an association of credit bureaus covering every square inch of the United States, a giant network of private information and opinion on individuals, information available only to those who buy it, with little safeguard to limit its ultimate use. Public official records are stored in government buildings in almost every city in America. The county clerk's office, there's a fund of public documentary evidence on any person who has ever lived in the area. You don't have to pose as a private detective or government agent to get information. It's all there for anyone who wants it. The clerks will get you transcripts from files of army discharges to marriage records. Nobody asks what your business is. The judgment books are in open files for anyone to pick up and get information on faulty payments and financial transactions. Records on the value of your house from the tax stamps when you bought it. There is information for any prying eye on minutes of court proceedings, records of arrests and convictions and scrapes with the law, marital breakups with divorce proceedings available in most states, with all the intimate lurid details including the accounts of times and places where adultery was committed. It's public information, but when compiled in a dossier, some of it can become personally damaging. And even more so are the confidential official files which are supposed to be kept secret, but are too often leaked for someone's personal advantage. Yale Law Professor Charles Reich cites two recent examples of how official files, state and federal, are sometimes leaked to discredit a person. We had a businessman who was the Republican candidate for governor of Connecticut, a man of uh, considerable success in the business world and of a uh, very fine reputation. Just uh, a few days before the election, there were full-page ads in the Connecticut papers stating that a government agency had found the Republican candidate to be in some fashion an unreliable or undesirable character. And this was an official finding from a file. Not only was the file supposed to be confidential, and it was not Connecticut but New York that it had come from, it turned out that the document in question had been found to be inaccurate and had been withdrawn. But that correction was never made in the ad or later. And so, uh, because it was so close to the election, the voters of this state were under the impression that the candidate had been officially determined to be a bad man in some way, although this was not true, he had no chance to rebut it. We've never found out how that leaked out of the New York state files, or why when it did leak, the correction didn't leak with it. But it represents a very good example of a serious abuse of the files. And I would comment that one ought not to have a system of files if it proves impossible to prevent abuses of this kind. In reading the paper recently, I came across a second illustration of this. Uh, a, a man came forward claiming that he had new information concerning Mr. Hoffa and his complicated affairs with the jury tampering case. The man may or may not be telling the truth. But in the very article that reported that he had new information, the paper said that this man was recorded in government files to be an unreliable character in various ways. And this description was so detailed so full of particular items that it was clear that somebody in the government had given the reporter this man's confidential file in an effort to refute the story that he was telling to the newspapers. As I say, maybe this particular man is indeed a liar, but the, 
The point that the files were being used for an improper purpose is unmistakable. And my feeling is that in addition to these public disclosures, there must be many instances in which blackmail is either threatened or actually happens because someone has possession of confidential information that belongs sealed in a file. The files, growing, bulging with information, are now being computerized. Within the federal government alone, it is a billion dollar business. The Defense Department is planning to use a computer capable of making one billion computations a second. State and local police records are already being hooked up on a national scale. Information retrieval in electronic data systems is virtually becoming instantaneous. Twenty federal departments and agencies collect and publish data, among them the Internal Revenue, Census, Labor, Health, Education and Welfare Departments. And they are beginning to computerize their files. Information has been supplied to these agencies by citizens, generally in the belief that it will be kept confidential and used only by that agency. Now it is proposed by the Budget Department that much of this information be pooled in one central source, the National Data Center. The economists and statisticians say it means better and more economical record keeping and greater efficiency. But does it also mean the end of privacy? Reels of plastic tape containing a profile of an individual stored in a single informational warehouse where the touch of a button would assemble all the governmental information about a person since his birth. Each reel of tape can record so much information that it would require a single office building to store information on every man, woman, and child in this country. Vance Packard sounded the warning when he wrote, my own hunch is that Big Brother, if he ever comes to the United States, may turn out to be not a greedy power seeker, but rather a relentless bureaucrat obsessed with efficiency. And he, more than a simple power seeker, could lead us to that ultimate of horrors, a humanity in chains of plastic tape. All we can expect is to hold off the data bank for a while, to get in our licks, because there are not only governmental data banks, there are private data banks which are acting in a most pernicious way in some instances for individual liberties. The collection of credit data in the Southwest and the Midwest now, for example, on computer is such an example. It's entirely likely that such collections of private data may ultimately be funneled in as an input to a governmental data bank in the future. A meeting of the American Civil Liberties Union in Washington these men, like other groups, including the Daughters of the American Revolution, are fearful that the National Data Center poses a threat to privacy and the American way of life. The data center is not just here and now. You build it with the best intentions now, you build it with limitations now, and tomorrow those intentions may pass and the limitations may dissolve. Uh, in addition, we might be able to identify certain kinds of information that are wholly innocuous or appear to be wholly innocuous because we think of it in a given context. And somebody comes up with a theory, which may be right and may be wrong, that if we take all of that data that previously was uh, for some completely different purpose, the impact of technology on un unemployment, and we slice it just a little bit this way, the right. machine can do that for us, we will know who is loyal and who is disloyal. Right. When I give my information to the Internal Revenue Service, I assume my, if you call it free choice or something like this, that Internal Revenue Service is going to keep it. I object to their having it, and I know that they divulge it to various and sundry sources improperly, but nevertheless, I, I give it to them for that purpose alone. I do not intend that this is to be put into a data bank where its potential is what bothers me. So this, just the mere gathering of it, the mere collating it into one, into one uh, large bank, or small bank, whatever you want to say, is the problem, the problem that, 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 that Ken raised. Because it may very well be that today you've got a J. Edgar Hoover, tomorrow you've got somebody else. And I don't know who's going to mishandle or handle the information properly. Regardless of all the safeguards of the head of the agency. And I don't trust heads of agencies any more than I trust interlopers or anybody else.
At the Princeton Institute of Advanced Study, its director, Carl Kazin, the man who headed the task force that recommended the data center to the president, assures us that it will only be used for statistics. And here I think it's important to make the distinction between a dossier and a statistical file. When we are building up a statistical file, we want to identify the individual only for the purpose of assembling all the data on him. So a statistical file identifies Carl Case and wants to identify him so that the facts that he is male, married, has two daughters, lives in a community of such and such population, has an income of between so and so and so and so, has so many degrees and so on, can all be hung together on one peg. That peg's Carl Case. The purpose of hanging that information together on the peg is to put it together with similar information for a similar group of people. And then you can, with that similar information, uh, let's say, uh, come to a conclusion as follows, that people with uh, two advanced degrees, by and large, have average earnings uh, per year, which are higher than those with people with no advanced degrees by such and such, or maybe lower by such and such, but some statistical conclusion. And the role of the individual is, so to speak, the peg to hang the data. A dossier, in principle, you're interested in the individual as such. You're interested in me, Carl Casey, not an assemblage of statistical characteristics. And this difference is the guideline to what a data center would try to do. There is no intention of putting dossier information, personnel file information in it. There is every reason why the Congress, in framing the legislation that would define what a data center is and what it should do, should simply put a flat prohibition in. How can it be guaranteed that the files will be kept to statistics? Already, as the New York Times reported recently, a data profile on all citizens is in the works in New Haven, Connecticut. A virtual prototype of the National Data Center it represents IBM's first attempt to program an entire city. Why New Haven? IBM selected it because it is manageable, a population of 151,000, and it is well run. At City Hall, Mayor Richard Lee is enthusiastically working with IBM. He thinks the prospect magnificent. He hopes New Haven will become a national model for computerizing other American cities. All information on the citizens of New Haven has been scattered throughout the various agencies with little check from one to another. Now, with a computer, it will all be together and easy to get at. Every agency of the city will pool its information into the computer. The police will have access to all records, from a divorce decree to mental health records, from a welfare application to an income tax statement. IBM officials said that the individual citizen's privacy would be protected by tight security. Only authorized officials would have access to the computer file. They didn't state whom these officials would be, nor would they probably be known to these people who are being computerized. Nor do they probably realize that in less than two years, their private records will be instantaneously available to a group of men who could prove to be the new elite the men who hold the keys to the new computer, the men who will know everything about everybody in New Haven. Probably the man in government most concerned with the computer and the invasion of privacy is Congressman Cornelius E. Gallagher of New Jersey, who recently headed a hearing on what he considered a great danger. The thing that worries me about the uh, computer, or as we head into the computerized, the age of the computerized man, is what effect this is going to have uh, on our society, uh, what effect it's going to have on our institutions, what effect it is going to have on man's uh, traditional uh, uh, right to live a life of dignity, uh, what effect it's going to have on his civil rights, uh, what effect it's going to have on our institutions. Because if uh, we really want to live in a uh, totally fishbowl society, where there is no privacy, where there is no secrets, where there is no uh, place where man can be alone to think new thoughts and trigger his imagination, or where he can be alone to uh, live uh, in a uh, <coughs> relaxed society with his family, 
In our embassies throughout the world, uh, uh, we have lead-lined rooms where we, we talk business. Now, uh, is the average recreation room uh, in the family going to have to be converted into a lead-lined room that no one can have access to, where the real uh, heart of the family life the real meaningful part of family life will have to take place in a windowless, airless, uh, lead-lined room. I think that what we like best in Americans is their willingness to be bold and their willingness to do what they please and say what they please. I think that's what's made us a great country. And I think that to have somebody watching you is a great inhibition of that fine part of the American character and a invitation to make us into time servers and uh, conformists. And when we realize that terrible danger of the files, I think we ought to ask ourselves, is it worth it? We get lots of information, but it doesn't really tell us very much. We don't know so much when we've read all this stuff, and I doubt if any employer finds the files as valuable as he thinks they will be. Human character is still a little too complicated to put down on paper. And I think that all of this gathering of information, all of this effort to be certain in advance how people will turn out, is rather futile, rather silly, rather useless. And if it was also harmless, I suppose I wouldn't be here objecting to it. But I think it is worth so little and so deeply harmful that we ought, before it becomes even more a part of each person's life, we ought to stop and think. The concern over the erosion of privacy in America by means of a new technology reaches from the aware and informed private citizen to the Supreme Court and one of its great justices, William O. Douglas, who spoke to us in his office in Washington. I'm afraid, now that we have some 20 minor data centers, that the tendency of uh, Americans to do what they can do well will be to put them all together and have one big one. I've been uh, <coughs> reading the uh, hearings that Senator Long of Missouri has been holding in the Senate, and Senator Gallagher. Uh, Congressman Gallagher has been holding in the House and doing a lot of thinking about this and it, it really has terrifying aspects um, because <coughs> a personnel file includes all sorts of things. Uh, <coughs> when I was a professor, when I was a practicing lawyer, when I was a head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, even now once in a while when I'm, as I'm a judge, I get inquiries from em employers, prospective employers, federal, state, private, uh, as respects some person that I knew. Is this person trustworthy? Is this person nervous? Is this person reliable? Is this person uh, honorable? Uh, does this person have extreme views? And all sorts of things. And. Um, and my appraisal of an individual, like anybody who was interviewed concerning Mr. X or Mr. Y, is highly subjective. Maybe we've known him for a long time. Maybe we've known him or her just for a short time. Maybe it was a student. Maybe the person whom we knew was going through some uh, uh, terrible cycle and it was a disturbed person. Maybe that person is no longer disturbed. Uh, maybe the condition that uh, we uh, identify with that person has been utterly removed. But the great danger is that these subjective things, once they uh, reach a machine, will become a fact. And um, so all you have to do is press a button and find out all the nervous people in the United States. Press a button and find out all the unreliable people in the United States. Press a button and find out all the subversive people in the United States. Everybody will, everybody will be categorized by somebody's subjective appraisal. We're supposed to live under a regime, a society, where um, there's a whole uh, room, a wide spectrum for idiosyncrasies, for the development of in individual tastes, 
in politics, music, economic theory, and everything. Um, and uh, with the uh, ten in the tendency in this country for conformity, regimentation, uh, <coughs> those, uh, those who are connected with the establishment, with the status quo, will tend to make their appraisals of people in those kinds of terms. And the computer will take those, and the computer will translate what is highly subjective into, into a fact. And that fact, uh, that fact will plague. Take, a, take the case of a, Take the case of, of an arrest. Have you ever been arrested? Has this man ever been arrested? Well, in the District of Columbia, we've had, we've had as high as 7,000 arrests a year for investigation. There's no such crime. Th those are unconstitutional arrests. You can't, you, in Russia, you can arrest a man for investigation but you're not supposed to arrest anybody in the United States unless you see him or her committing a crime or unless you have a uh, evidence that you submit to a magistrate showing probable cause that this person has committed a crime, then the magistrate issues an arrest warrant. All right, you have all these uh, unconstitutional arrests. Some parts of our country, you have a <coughs> civil rights pr uh, protester who's exercising a constitutional right to assemble, guaranteed by the First Amendment, to petition the government, guaranteed by the First Amendment, to make a speech, guaranteed by the First Amendment, to hand out a pamphlet, guaranteed by the First Amendment, arrested by the police. Why? Well, he's unpopular. He belongs to the wrong race. He's espousing the wrong set of ideas. They charge him with what? Vagrancy. They charge him with what? Disorderly conduct, trespass, breach of the peace, conventional instrumentalities for um, suppressing the unpopular. This, uh, the problem of erasing an arrest that has later been held to be unconstitutional is a considerable problem. I don't know of any surefire way of doing it. There's been no method, no routine method to date worked out. So everything goes into the computer is in, and this, this criminal, so-called criminal record may come back to a man when he's 50 years old and being about to be promoted the head of a big uh, federal agency. And here's this criminal record uh, against him, a wholly unconstitutional thing. These are, these are some of the very dangerous potentialities of the, of the data center. Is what's good for industry good for the country? It wasn't meant to be good for Ralph Nader. It may be good business for the credit companies to talk to your neighbors about your personal life, but such prying could cause you personal embarrassment and damage. These activities already pose a serious threat to the survival of individual privacy. But now, if the National Data Center comes into being, it must be given sufficient safeguards to assure that it will not result in the end of privacy as we know it. If the struggle to preserve privacy is important enough, now is the time to decide whether what's good for industry, the credit companies, and even the efficiency of government is to take precedence, to decide if this baby is to grow up to an Orwellian nightmare or a world in which 1984 is just another year. National Educational Television Network.